Hello, everyone, and I'm glad you joined in. Um, 40 years ago, I bought a guidebook of, to Santa Barbara, the 1941 Public Works Administration guidebook. And in it, I found this quote. That, that's the cover of the book. Um, and I found this quote. The old landmarks and most charming characteristics of Santa Barbara are disappearing before the march of, quote, improvement, unquote. And though our practical people cannot move the mountains nor change the seas, nor spoil the climate, they are doing all they can to despoil the quaint beauty of the place and make it just a commonplace American town. This is an editorial from the Morning Press of January 3rd, 1874. I was astonished, 1874? I know Santa Barbara has a long history of civic activism about how it has developed, but I had no idea it went back so far. What is it about Santa Barbara that has made its residents so concerned about how it has developed? What has made Santa Barbara what it is? It was this quote and these questions that led me to writing this history. I spent many hours in the Glen Hill Library, at the Historical Museum, without the endless kind help of uh, Michael Redman and more recently Chris Irvin you just heard from, and the library's resources. I couldn't have written this, written this book. So many thanks to the Historical Museum. While looking for a photo of the original entry, State Street entry to El Paseo, I even found a reference to my own family. Next. The Acme Furniture Company, you see the sign, the sign for it up on the side of the building and on the truck, belonged to my uncle. But I want you to place, pay attention to 820 State Street, a very modest one-story building. We'll be coming back to that site. One thing I learned doing research that is very hard to be accurate. For example, I knew that Bernard Hoffman was very influential in creating Santa Barbara's iconic architecture. And so I looked him up online and I found a grad student's master's thesis about him. Uh, in it, the author wrote, on April 9th, 1850, the same day that California was admitted to the Union, Santa Barbara was incorporated by city charter. Knowing that California was admitted to the Union five months later on September 9th, I wondered where this came from. And there was a proper citation at the, in the footnote, and I looked, and next, next slide, it was from this monograph on Santa Barbara. And I looked and it had been quoted from there. The grad student who wrote that chapter never even checked on it, but this error got repeated. So one has to be extremely careful what one, what one thinks are the correct dates. The five month delay was the result of a great conflict in, co in Congress over whether new states would be admitted as slave or free. The year before, the California delegates, delegates to the California Constitutional Convention voted unanimously to be a free state. Congress was kind of, the, the Southern states were kind of put off by this. It took months of congressional negotiations and the passage of five bills to balance up the numbers of states that would be slave or free. In addition, one congressman opined that California's 92,000 population wasn't enough for there to be a state. And he added, it never would be. Little did he know. And so did the history. Chumash Native American villages existed in the area of Santa Barbara for some 13,000 years before Europeans arrived. Santa Barbara began next as a Spanish community with the establishment of the Presidio or fort in 1782. Captain George Vancouver, the British Navy visited in 1793. He described the terrain as being chiefly composed of barren naked mountains. And he said there were a few groveling shrubs. The mission priests brought with them almost all the plants and seeds needed to support the mission, which, which was established four years later after the Presidio. 
but it, it was only, it only took 20 years after the establishment of a mission, next, that a dam was built in the Botanic garden, Gardens to provide water for irrigation purposes uh, in this semi-arid climate. And this was the first effort to provide additional water supplies and one and a half mile long stone aqueduct carries water from the dam to the mission. Perhaps next, perhaps some of you are like me and have driven by this stone wall many times and have never looked at it. Uh, I knew it was part of the aqueduct system, but not how. Next. Then I walked up and saw the aqueduct is on top of the wall. Of course, originally across the road over onto the side, the mission side. <clears throat> Next. This mid 1830s drawing shows the very barren hills. There are only very few trees. Santa Barbara by this time was no longer under the control of Spain. Mexico won its independence in 1821 and ruled its Alta California territory with a rather light hand. As Chris had mentioned earlier, the Santa Barbara City Council began planning for the now American town at its second meeting. Next. In 1851, a grid was laid out over the existing development and the, you can see it crosses existing adobes, it plays no attention whatsoever to the creek. And this was a method of urban planning that goes back thousands of years, as many as 4,000 years ago. This was used in developing city plans. Next slide, please. That grid was laid out in 450 foot squares, and that's what exists today. Uh, this 1877 bird's eye view includes Stern's Wharf on the right. It was built in 1872, and it was part of the reason for the editorial um, mourning the change in Santa Barbara. It made it much easier to import lumber, and the new American residents preferred Victorian wooden houses to the charming, but sometimes dark and sometimes dirt floored adobes. Next. This photo taken sometime after 1875, the court, county courthouse is in the middle distance and on the right, and then you can see the mission on top of the hill. Next slide. This is a drawing of that 1875 courthouse, and I want you to notice the gentleman tipping his hat to the lady in the lower left corner. Ornamental trees were planted by American newcomers, and they soften the no longer barren landscape. Starting in the late 19th century, horticulturalists began importing plants from all around the world to this place where just about everything grows. Almost everywhere in Santa Barbara. Next. From a hill looking down. Next. Or even on its main downtown street. You see mostly trees. There are three things I hope you take away from this talk. This is the first one. To realize how critically important Santa Barbara's urban forest is to its beauty and the health of its environment. Trees not only clean the air we breathe and provide many other physical be uh, benefits, they make us happier. People are less depressed where there are trees. As more Americans heard about Santa Barbara's beauty and its climate, some began to winter here year after year. Next. One of these was Kate Wiggin, author of Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. In 1892, lamenting changes taking place since she first came to Santa Barbara 20 years before, she wrote, the Siren Village has changed its former aspect in these later years. One is almost sorry for it when it remembers the charm that hovered about it in its pre-civilized days. Now it has a mayor and a railroad and a fire company and the interesting little hamlet is in danger of becoming modern, commonplace and inartistic. 
As population grew, additional water was needed. Seven 200 well, foot wells were drilled in 1887. Nine years later, Santa Barbara was running out of water again. A horizontal well was drilled into the mountains which produced enough water per day for 2,500 people. Some said, for the time being, Santa Barbara's municipal water worries are over. However, just eight years later, demand again exceeded supply. And a 3.7 mile long tunnel going through the mountains to access Santa Inez River water was begun. Completed in 1912, it was the longest water tunnel in the world at the time. Infiltration into the tunnel itself provided and still provides a significant amount of water. Next. Gibraltar Dam was built in 1918, built 1918 to 1920 to capture storm water on the Santa Inez River. That mission tunnel brought it to Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara's water problems had been solved for all time. Prior to the end of the 19th century, cities generally grew in a haphazard fashion, often with congested, unsanitary, dark tenements and without parks or open space. In the late 1800s, the City Beautiful movement began from a desire to create more attractive and livable urban environments. Next. The Chicago World's Fair of 1893 played a key role in its creation. It illustrated how city planners could bring open spaces and grand public buildings into crowded cities. Building codes were adopted that required more light and air in buildings. Cities across the country Began interest, became interested in community improvement and beautification. In 1902, the Santa Barbara City Council appointed its first Parks Commission. When I began my research, I knew that in the early 20th century, in places where um, had settled, it became the style to, to build Spanish colonial style. I did not realize how many of such buildings have been built early on here in Santa Barbara. Next, the train station in 1905. Next, 1913, the Riviera campus and Santa Barbara's library. Next, in 1917. In 1912 in Ojai, a Midwestern industrialist was building a second home. Next, he didn't approve of this far western style wooden storefront in Ojai then, and the wooden sidewalks, and he decided Ojai should have a makeover with a mission arcade. Next. This redo, completed in 1917, inspired many others. The most famous example remains in Santa Barbara, where in 1922, the city activist Bernard Hoffman proclaimed himself an admirer of, Libby's, of Mr. Libby's project. As I continued to do research, it became clear that if it had not been for certain individuals, Santa Barbara would be a very different place. It would not have the distinctive built environment for which it is famous if two civic activists, next, Pearl Chase, who gets far more credit than she deserves, and Bernard Hoffman, who gets far less credit than he deserves, had not worked hard to urge and guide Santa Barbara toward the use of Spanish colonial revival architecture style. 1906, while a student at UC Berkeley, Pearl Chase, came home for Christmas vacation, got off the train, looked around and didn't like what she saw. She determined then that if she didn't do anything else with her life, she would devote herself to making Santa Barbara a better place. She later said, I do not fight against things as much as I promote better things. As far as I'm concerned, I haven't achieved much. I just make other people want to do it. She wrote of city planning, a city that develops finally should delight the eye, feed the intellect, and lead the people out of the bondage of the commonplace. In 1919, next, Bernard and Irene Hoffman arrived in Santa Barbara with their diabetic daughter. She was to be treated by a local, locally noted diabetes specialist. The Hoffmans quickly became engaged in the community. Uh, he arranged to restore Casa de la Guerra and built to create El Paseo around it. In 1920, Chase formed the Santa Barbara Community Arts Association to encourage music, the arts, and drama. In 1922, a fourth division was added, Plans and Planting. Hoffman became its chair. 
He helped guide the design of public buildings, including Mex, Santa Barbara High School, Mex, the Libero Theater, Mex, and City Hall. The, all three were built a year or two before the earthquake. Described as a practical idealist by Pearl Chase, often was secretary to the city's first planning commission. It was my second takeaway for you is that Pearl Chase is not the person responsible for Santa Barbara's iconic architecture. It's Bernard Hoffman. Then after it was too late to add to my book, I came across this quote from Hoffman. Perhaps it's because we were newcomers. In reality, this is Mrs. Hoffman's dream that we saw the possibilities of restoring some of the old time beauty and picturesqueness and preserving what we already have. So it was Irene Hoffman who was the inspiration behind her husband's activities. She has to be thanked along with him next as they both are in this plaque placed in El Paseo in 1935. On June 29th, 1925, a major earthquake struck Santa Barbara often described as destroying or devastating Santa Barbara damage was much less than widely reported. After the earthquake, architects came up with a Spanish colonial revival vision of how a rebuilt Santa Barbara might look. Next slide. 11 days after the earthquake, based on the work of the Plans and Planning Committee under Hoffman, the city council passed an ordinance establishing an architectural board of review the first in the United States and an idea that originated with Hoffman. Next slide. Facades of unreinforced masonry had crumbled, leaving the buildings behind. This made for some very dramatic photographs. The Hotel California had opened just four days before the earthquake. The facade was rebuilt in Spanish colonial revival style. In eight months, the hotel had a second grand opening it wasn't until 80 years later that the building itself was demolished while the second facade was retained in the building of a new Hotel California. The buildings of Spanish colonial revival style fared well during the earthquake, making it desirable structurally as well as aesthetically. And facades were rebuilt in that style all along State Street. New facades on the buildings that remained uh, making it, um, giving it what became its iconic look. Next slide. This is the intersection of State and Carrillo before, prior to the earthquake. Uh, note the building on the near corner and the building on the far corner. We're looking down State Street. Next. Now we're looking up State Street that Spanish style building with its very large arches still there. Roman arches are very sturdy. But the Victorian building is gone, replaced by what, what buildings that are still there in, in their Spanish colonial revival style. Hoffman hoped that people would say, oh yes, Santa Barbara, you know, as it, as it rebuilt with this style. That's the place where they're so fussy about their architecture. Next. A particularly splendid example is the Santa Barbara County Courthouse. Most praise the distinctive style. However, the publisher and editor of the Santa Barbara Daily News, T.M. Stork, editorialized that any attempt to force a businessman to build in Mission Colonial was an infringement on his personal rights, if not a communistic idea. Unfortunately, opposition to the authority of the Architectural Board of Review grew after it, and at its first meeting in January, 1926, the newly elected council directed that the ordinance establishing the ABR be repealed eight months after its adoption. Ms. Chase said, it broke Mr. Hoffman's heart, literally. Citing ill health, Hoffman stepped down from all community responsibilities, but by then his vision of a new Santa Barbara, a new Spain in Santa Barbara, had a momentum that would not be stopped. Chase became chair of plans and planting, where she continued for 50 more years to make a Santa Barbara a better place through what was described as her irresistible persuasiveness. 
She wouldn't even give people a chance to say no when she asked something of them. <clears throat> it took 23 years for the city to reestablish its ABR, quote, with the intent of protecting from preserving the natural and historic charm and beauty of the city. In addition to its architecture, Santa Barbara is distinctive for its miles of publicly owned, accessible, and open to view waterfront. Next. Creation of Santa Barbara's beaches began in 1903 when the city council designated all city owned property between what is now Cabrillo Boulevard and the mean high water mark for park use. And so those are the red marks that they're not to scale, but it gives you a general idea of what the city already owned. In 1924, however, developers optioned 1,500 feet or about three blocks worth of beach frontage for small stores and quote, amusements, unquote. Almost immediately, a group of civically concerned citizens got together and they included Bernard Hoffman to pool their money and buy up all the remaining privately owned land between Stern's Wharf, the um, lumber yard that was next east of Stern's Wharf from there all the way to the end of what is of East Beach. In 1925, the state of California uh, conveyed the city title of the harbor area. Then when a proposal to develop that lumber yard with quote, high class amusements, unquote. Next slide, uh, was made in 1927. Many of the same civic leaders financed the purchase of that property to be held until city voters could pass another bond measure to buy it. The high class amusements would have cut off almost two blocks of the waterfront from view and access. If these civic minded citizens hadn't acted promptly, Santa Barbara's waterfront might look like this. Next. This is, this is Santa Cruz. The beach is the other side of the amusements to your right. Next, this is Santa Monica. It has three and a half miles of beach, but most of it is blocked off from view and access by development. Next, Santa Barbara is blessed as the result of the efforts of those who came before. This is Cabrillo Boulevard and Santa Barbara's waterfront looking west from Calle Puerto Vallarta. Next, Shoreline Park is a 15 acre coastal bluff Park, west of Ledbetter Beach. The city voters approved a bond measure to buy it in 1964. Next. The bluff and wooded area in the area in the foreground is the Douglas Family Preserve. The preserve is the city's largest coastal park. In 1995, the community was given 30 days to come up, up with $3.5 million to pay off the mortgage and buy the property. Uh, People rushed out to try to raise the fund by the funds by the 29th day. They were $600,000 short. Actor Michael Douglas, who was a UCSB grad and a sometime resident of Santa Barbara, came up with the missing remaining $600,000. And that is why the park is called the Douglas Family Preserve. Through the generous and timely action of Many civic minded private citizens and voter approval of bonds and state grants of Thailand's, the city acquired its 4.2 miles of beautiful public waterfront, all of it open for public access and public view. Santa Barbara is also distinctive in that it took charge of the planning its future early on. Its first planning commission had its initial meeting on September 23rd in 1923. It was one of the first planning commissions in the country, even though California had passed legislation uh, authorizing the creation of, of planning commissions and of general plans, plans laying out how a city would develop. At its first meeting, next slide, Charles Cheney, working with landscape architects Olmsted Brothers, was approved. Um, he clearly had been preparing. He had this proposal that in two year, two year program that included, so you can see preparation of a comprehensive zoning ordinance, a comprehensive major traffic street plan, comprehensive program of parks and school playgrounds, 
and plans for improvement of the architecture and general attractiveness of the city, something also provided for in state law. One year later, in 1924, Cheney and the Olmsted brothers presented their streets, recreation, and parks plans, next, to the Planning Commission, uh, including this one for the Bird Refuge. I see that little round circle sort of in the, to the upper right. It included a roundabout at Los Patos Way and Cabrillo Boulevard. It only took almost 100 years, but in May 2018, the current Planning Commission approved its construction. The tool for urban planning is zoning. Uh, determining what parts of a town will be for what uses. In 1926, Euclid, Ohio was challenged in court by a property owner who was on the basis that restricting the use of property violated the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which in part says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Zoning was a new concept and there were those who believed it was an unle unreasonable intrusion into private property rights for governments to make those restrictions. The court in finding, the Supreme Court, in finding that there was a valid government interest in maintaining the character of a neighborhood and, in, and deciding where certain uses would be in a community had public, was of public interest. And it allowed for the subsequent adoption of planning of zoning ordinances across the country. At the Planning Commission meeting's first fifth meeting, Cheney presented a preliminary zoning ordinance outline. By April 1924, the ordinance was before the City Council. It was adopted in May 1924, eight months after the first Planning Commission meeting. That is extraordinary speed to adopt such a thing these days. Uh, next. However, in the interim, great controversy arose over it. Letters to the editor praising and damning it appeared. Uh, and there were display ads and support and opposition. This is one that's uh, in support. Uh, and it suggested the, uh, there was another one that suggested it was a communist plot. The zoning ordinance was a communist plot. Um, the ad, this ad supports zoning, stating that it's necessary for proper development of the community, uh, but that not this one. Um, it seemed to be agreement that a zoning ordinance was a good thing to have, but a different version. And it was repealed weeks after its adoption. A new zoning ordinance wasn't adopted until more than two years later. In 1925, the city council decided that a new city charter was needed. An election for a board of freeholders to draft a new one was held in, um, in May 1926. The new city charter was presented to the city council in August. A majority of the members of the council were opposed to the draft, not only because it's defective in substance, but because it abolishes the progressive managerial form of government. The Morning Press, Mr. Stork's paper, editorial, uh, I'm sorry, the opposition paper, the, other, the alternative paper, editorialized that it can say without reserve that the measure is considerable of a mess. The Santa Barbara Daily News, Stork's paper, reported on difficulties with the existing charter and making needed changes. The new charter was approved by the voters in November. It took effect on June 1st, 1927, six months later, when an entirely new city council was seated. One of its first items of business was a passage of an emergency ordinance to provide for a building department and a purchasing agent, the new charter failing to provide for them. It was said to be considerable of a mess, you may remember. Uh, the city report, attorney then reported that there was no planning commission. One news story said that the omission of the planning commission in the city charter was the result of political enmity between certain members of the, uh, of the board elected to draft the new charter and some of the members of the planning commission. Petty politics had prevailed. Not only had the city lost its progressive professional management, 
it seemed to have lost its sense of common interest in the community altogether. Eventually, the council replaced the planning commission, but it didn't begin to function again for another 18 months. The major factor for growth and in the Santa Barbara South Coast region has been and is UCSB. Uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Goleta Valley became one of the fastest growing areas in the country uh, because of it. That growth could not have occurred without the, excuse me, without the construction of Kajuma Jam and Reservoir on the Santa Inez River it was completed in 1953. Five years later, the reservoir held little more than one-tenth of its capacity, confirming the view of those that there would be, who thought there would never be enough rain to fill it. The peeved opponents of the project said that it was an example of, of a dry lake monument to New Deal extravagance. Then the rains came in the wettest winter in 17 years, and Kachuma spilled in April 8, 1958, holding enough water to last 18 years at the then current rates of consumption. The project was hailed as the solution to 150 years of water problems. Downtown, Mr. and Mrs. Thaddeus Susky asked for a height variance for their property at 820 State Street. And that small building that I showed you pointed out next to the entry to El Paseo. They asserted that they had to have a building that exceeded the existing height, feet, height limit of 60 feet to generate enough revenue for the costly maintenance of El Paseo next door, which they also owned. Several planning commissioners expressed concern about the preservation of El Paseo, while the Suskies hinted that they might tear it down and build something else there if they didn't get the variance. The planning commission approved the variance um, and, um, and some of the commissioners asked, you know, that's for assur assurance of the, about the maintenance of El Paseo, and Mrs. Susky asked that they have faith in them. The variance was approved. Next slide. The big building behind is the building that replaced the little one-story building on where it fronts on State Street. It overwhelms historic and charming El Paseo in the foreground. In 1968, another proposal was made for development exceeding the 60-foot height limit. Next, it was for two 107-foot nine-story condo towers. Neighbors Terry and Penny Davies had heard about it and they had seen Miami Beach. Next. Fearing that a similar fate might befall Santa Barbara, they and many others, including Pearl Chase, vigorously opposed the project. The Planning Commission unanimously denied it, and the proponents appealed to the City Council. Despite that op all that opposition, the Council granted the variance to the existing City Ordinance to allow the towers. They were 62 feet taller than the City Ordinance allowed. After Council approval, Terry Davies, who was an engineer, and Estelle Bush and Francis Yulo, neighborhood housewives, searched for an attorney who would work for them pro bono and without pay to sue the city. They were successful and their attorney was successful. The judge ruled that the city had violated its own ordinance and that the variance could not be granted. In an interview many years later, Bush said, Peons were able to sue 29 of the wealthiest people in the community. The council, the mayor, Jerry Beaver and Bill Alexander, they were the developers. And we won. In 1975, Alice Keck Park bought the El Marisol land to give to the city of Santa Barbara for a park. And because of the concern of two housewives, a research engineer and the generosity of Alice Keck Park, next. Santa Barbara has a lovely garden instead of two 107 foot condo towers. In February, 1972, another large project was proposed next that caused community controversy. Southern Pacific, which owned most of the property between Cabrillo and the railroad tracks, uh, proposed to move Cabrillo north and to 
build a thousand hotel room and 2000 person conference center between the relocated Cabrillo and the, um, and the beach. Residents heard about the proposal and became very concerned about continued access to the beach. An ad hoc committee for Santa Barbara was formed. A goal was, its goal was to have a much smaller hotel and conference center and increased park area on the north side of Cabrillo Boulevard. Southern Pacific met with the committee and numerous other groups in August it announced a new proposal next. Cabrillo remained where it was and all development was north of it. However, it was still a thousand room hotel and 2000 person conference center. There was about a half mile of buildings cutting off almost all views of the mountains from Cabrillo and the beach. Years went by with continuing negotiations. Um, last agreement was reached on a 360 room hotel and a thousand person conference center, hugely reduced in size center. Next. This low intensity development is the result of years of battles, I should say, and an election. It is appropriate for and sensitive to its extraordinary setting, a setting created in part by the people of Santa Barbara. Niall Underback was another individual who made a big difference. In 1970, he was appointed to the Santa Barbara Planning Commission. Santa Barbara already felt crowded. Next slide. Boxy apartment buildings and concrete were replacing single family homes. The character of established neighborhoods was changing. Next slide. This is the sort of development that those buildings were displaced and this is one that remains. Utterback asked planning staff what the build out would be under the current zoning. How many people would Santa Barbara under that zoning ultimately have? The answer was around 100,000 people or more than twice the existing population. How could the city hold that many people and maintain its quality of life? Where would the resources come from to support them? We're already having water issues and air quality issues. In 1973, a group called the Citizens Coalition formed to find council candidates who were concerned about development and other environmental issues. The coalition arranged for a meeting place and ran an ad in the paper inviting anyone interested in the council election to come, and many people did come. Next. The coalition chose to support Utterback, a lower left photograph, and th the three others. All four were elected, changing the balance on the council to an environmentally concerned majority. Utterback campaigned on implementing an immediate emergency ordinance in the multiple zones, cutting density in half. In other words, there would be half as many in any new development, half as many apartments. Its adoption was one of the first actions of the city council. It gave the council time to have a study done on the impacts of growth. An ad hoc group led by two UCSB sociology professors was formed. The group gathered and analyzed a huge amount of data in the pre-desktop computer era. They met with groups all around the city. They analyzed the city's economy. Outside income came from retirement funds, tourism, and some high-tech industry. The results of their work, the impacts of growth report is a milestone planning document. The task force made no recommendation about an opt you know, what sh should pop Santa Barbara's population be, but they did say anything that reduces the high quality of life here impacts negatively its economy. The report concluded that there were many disadvantages to growth. Greater density meant higher crime rates, dirtier air, more traffic congestion, and higher city costs. The report recommended that the city not just change the residential zoning. For most people, it's jobs that bring them to a community. Reducing the jobs creation potential was a critical part uh, in the non-residential areas to help preserve something of a jobs housing balance, enough housing for the people who fill the jobs in the community. The council set the impacts report impacts of growth report to the planning commission. And by that time I had been appointed to it. 
And um, on the day the commission was to, after having reviewed the report and the day the commission was to decide on a, a level to suggest to the Black City Council, one of the commissioners came prepared with a draft resolution. It was for what became the famous or infamous, depending on your point of view, uh, 85,000 population goal. A lot of people think of it as a cap. There's no way to put a cap on a number of people that live in a community, but it was a goal that with the proper zoning, this is what would be achieved at full growth. I thought, wow, this is a bold move. It was an appropriate number in terms of our resources, water and air basin capacity and so on. Uh, during a break, I, I said to the city planning director, do you think we can get away with this? Because it was anticipated that the council would go with a considerably higher level goal. He replied, why not try? And so we did. Numerous community meetings were held. Next, a pamphlet asking how many people should there be? Presenting an outline of the report was printed and distributed with the city's daily newspaper. Planning Commission voted to recommend the 85,000 population goal to the city council. Since I wanted to be where the final decision was going to be made, I ran for the city council and was elected. The commission's recommendation was adopted by the city council on a four to three vote. Butterbag's question about how many people there would be in Santa Barbara at the then current zoning led to a down zoning which provided for a far more sustainable population number. Without his efforts and without his vision of what was needed to maintain Santa Barbara's high quality of life, this would be again a quite different city. In 1987, the city began a general plan update, um, a process that dealt with the job side of the jobs housing balance. We've not been able to deal with it uh, at the same time as we did the residential part. After a year and a half of studies and public hearings, planning staff created a formula for non-residential growth. The formula was written into a 1989 ballot measure to assure that it could not be changed without a vote of the people. The innovative measure passed, providing a way of pacing new job creation in Santa Barbara in the city charter. Then drought struck Santa Barbara again, it lasted from 1987 to 1992. As water supplies dwindled, the city began looking for new sources. The council decided to proceed with the construction of a desalination plant. It was while costly it could be accomplished in the shortest period of time of all the alternatives. It would be under the city's control and used as needed and unless the ocean dried up, it was an assured source. The city has somewhat reluctantly signed up for a small amount of state water from the California State Water Project. That project was committed to delivering way more water than it had, about twice much as much. And during a drought when the city would need it most, it wouldn't be there as we have experienced. Uh, and in 1979, the Santa Barbara County voters turned down a measure approving the bonds to, to pay for construction of the pipeline to bring that water to Kachuma. Uh, but um, next. The additional, the potential additional supplies could have encouraged unsustainable development. By February of 1991, Kachuma was at 15% of capacity after five years of drought. The then, and then the March miracle storms of 1991 dumped 23 inches on the watershed upstream of Gibraltar Reservoir and it spilled. That June, state water bonds were on the ballot again. Next, this time after five years of bonds, water police and careful conservation, the bond measure passed. A measure to make the desalination plant permanent also passed. It seemed that Santa Barbara's water supplies were for sure assured. In September 2005, the city began preparation for another general plan update. I had left office in 1993, but because of the direct, my concern about the direction the update seemed to be going, I applied for and was appointed once again to the Planning Commission in 2008. As with previous general plan updates, there was public outreach with dozens of meeting large, meetings, large and small. 
When people were asked what they loved about Santa Barbara, they said it's small town feel, diverse population, scenic beauty, distinctive architecture, particularly downtown, preservation of historic character and its vibrant and dynamic culture. A major problem was the lack of affordable housing. More than, this was not a new issue. City One History noted by 1930, the council's weekly docket contained items such as rezoning requests to ease the housing crisis. In 1948, a special ad hoc committee said the most pressing problem in the city is the lack of affordable housing. More than 26,000 additional housing units have been built since 1948 and the problem continues. Some believe that if densities increased, it would be possible for developers to build market rate affordable housing. In effect, the down zoning of 1975 would be overturned. Dale Francisco, a UCSB graduate, had come back to Santa Barbara after some years in the high tech industry. Elected the council in 2007, he was very skeptical of the benefits of increased density, although he thought it might work for rental housing. In April 2010, in an effort, effort to reach a compromise between those who wanted to raise increased density everywhere in the city and those who didn't want to increase it anywhere, I suggested an experiment be made on increasing density for, in, for rental housing only in a limited area of the city. Um, presumably units would be less expensive by design. This was to be a test program uh, a design charrette was held in July of 2011, which developers hoped to prove that they could, with higher densities, build middle-income affordable units, both for sale and for rent. Uh, higher densities did make it possible for affordable rental housing to be built, they said. Uh, rents would start at $1,200 a month. Councilmember Francisco pushed through a high-density rental development test program limited in the area, in time, and in number of units, what became known as the AUD high priority overlay. If he hadn't been there, the 1975 down zoning likely would have been undone, and Santa Barbara would be facing what I believe would be an uncertain and unsustainable future. When I made the test suge the suggestion for the text pro test program next, I had in mind Casa de las Fuentes, this beautiful housing authority project at Carrillo and Castillo streets. Its density is 57 dwelling units to the acre. High density projects that fit within the community can be done well. However, next, what the city got first is the mark under the new program. To my dismay, its rents began at $2,445 a month, twice what the design charrette had projected and went up to 4,100. I was naive or just plain dumb. There is no such thing as uh, <laughs> things as affordable by design. Rents will be what the market will bear. And in Santa Barbara, that's a lot. A new drought began in 2011, one that became the most severe in recorded history. Next, the mothball desalination plant was put back into service. In the meanwhile, local government's ability to control their own planning, to decide how they will develop, is being eroded by new state laws. Another change is in the culture in the planning department over the last 25 years. Staff is directed to not do a thing unless the council tells them to do it. How is the council to know what to tell them what to do if they don't know what the, all the possibilities are? if the professionals do not inform them. City staff is sometimes told to just answer questions. Council won't necessarily know what questions need to be asked. With term limits, a council member's time in office is limited while planning staff remains. This makes it even more important that council that staff for the professionals provide, that share with council their knowledge and experience so truly informed decisions can be made. Santa Barbara has not become a commonplace town. Our practical people still cannot move the mountains or change the sea. Unfortunately, we all have a hand in spoiling the climate. It has been the many people 
who have cared about this place and through the gifts of their time, money, and passion have made it what it is. Housewives, engineers, elected officials, planners, peons, the wealthy, and others of all walks of life fought against the commonplace. Next. This is classic Santa Barbara. If we lose this kind of urban environment, we lose what makes Santa Barbara unique, what gives it its special sense of place. We harm our economy. Tourists come here to, not to see what they have at home, but what Santa Barbara is unique, can uniquely provide. The Santa Barbara County Courthouse pre-pandemic was the most highly rated place for tourists to visit. Um, Santa Barbara has not only had a sense of place, it's had a sense of community. I urge all who care about Santa Barbara to be part of it, to get involved and stay involved. The third thing I hope you take away from this talk is how fragile what we have, what's been created here is. If housewives hadn't found that attorney, uh, if the peak community activists, the concerned citizens had put up the money to buy the land so for the, on the waterfront, we would have, we might have looked like Santa Monica. It's critical for everyone, just each person can make a difference to be involved. It's in everyone's interest to protect and enhance this special and still uncommonplace American town. Thank you.